My name is Crystal and I'm a member of the Miami Children's Museum's Theater Troupe. Today we're going to be reading a story as part of our month-long programming for Black History Month, sponsored by BNC Bank, but it's not just any story. You see, I really wanted to be an astronaut when I was a little girl, and this story helps me dream big. We're going to be reading Hidden Figures, the true story of four black women and the space race. You're wondering what the space race is. Well, it was when, showing off one of my favorite Lego sets here, we put someone on the moon. So let's find out how it happened and the women that made it happen. But before we get started, I have a very special friend that's going to be joining us. My friend Roger Montero is an industrial electrician at Kennedy Space Center, where the magic happens, literally where the launches happen. It's so cool because he's going to be reading with me virtually, meaning we are going to get to see some areas in Kennedy Space Center that only employees can go to. I hope you enjoy. Here we go. Hi, my name is Roger Montero, and I want to narrate a story. It's a book uh, by New York Times bestselling author, Margaret Lee Shetterly, uh, written with uh, Winfred Conkling. Uh, the name of the book is Hidden Figures, and it's a story about tr uh, the true story about four black women in the space race. So Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden, they were good at math. They were really good at math. In 1943, the United States was at war, World War II. Dorothy Vaughan wanted to serve her country by working for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the government agency that designs airplanes. Having the best airplanes would help America win the war, making airplanes fly faster and higher and safer meant doing lots of tests at the agency's Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. Tests meant numbers, numbers meant math and math meant computers. Today we think of computers as machines, but in the 1940s, computers were actually people like Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine. Their job was to do math. Because Dorothy was black and a woman, some people thought it would be impossible for her to get a job as a computer. She lived in Virginia, a Southern state where laws segregated or kept apart people, black and white people. They cannot eat in the same restaurants. They cannot drink from the same water fountains. They could not use the same restrooms, cannot attend the same schools. They could not play on the same sports teams. They could not sit near each other in movie theaters. They could not marry someone of a different race. But Dorothy didn't think it was impossible. She was good at math, really good. She knew she was the right person for the job. She applied and the laboratory offered her a position as a computer. <laughs> at work, blacks and whites were kept apart. The white computers worked in one building and Dorothy and the other black computers worked in a different building in their separate office. Even though they worked on the same kinds of assignments, black computers and white computers used separate bathrooms and ate lunch in separate lunch rooms. America won the war in 1945, but Dorothy stayed on the job, still trying to make airplanes faster and safer. By 1951, the Americans and the Russians were competing to see who could build the best planes. That meant more experiments and more numbers, lots and lots of numbers. And more numbers meant the need for more computers. That's when Mary Jackson got a job as a computer at Langley. She worked in a group that tested model airplanes in a wind tunnel. A wind tunnel was a machine like a huge metal box with a powerful fan attached. Mary put model airplanes in the wind tunnel and blasted them with air from a fan. This experiment helped her group improve their designs on the models before building full-sized airplanes. Mary wanted to become an engineer, but officials said it was impossible. Most of the engineers at the laboratory were men. And to become an engineer, Mary needed to take high-level math classes. But she wasn't always allowed to go inside the white school where the classes were taught. But Mary was good at math, really good, and she refused to give up. She got permission to enter the school building and take math classes, and she earned good grades. Because she didn't give up, Mary Jackson became the first African-American female engineer at the laboratory. Shh. 
Katherine Johnson was good at math and always asks lots of questions. In 1953, she applied to the laboratory for a computer job and was placed on a team that tested actual planes while they were flying in the air. Their research was used to figure out ways to prevent future plane crashes. In one of her first projects, she learned how to analyze turbulence or dangerous gusts of air. No one knows how many lives her work may have helped save. Catherine wanted to help the group of parents research reports, so she asked if she could go to the meetings with the other experts on her team. Her boss told her it was impossible. Women aren't allowed to attend the meetings, he said, but Catherine knew she was as good at math as anyone else, maybe better, so she asked him again, and again, and again. Catherine asked her boss so many times that he finally invited her to the meetings. Catherine was good at math, really good, and because she fought to be treated the same as the men, she became the first woman in her group to sign her name to one of the group's reports. In the 1950s, the Langley Laboratory bought a machine computer that could do math faster than the human computers. At first, these machines make mistakes. Dorothy learned how to program the machines so that they got the right answers. She taught the woman in her group how to program the computers too. In 1957, Russia launched a satellite known as Sputnik in orbit around the Earth. The United States started building satellites to explore space as well. For years, the laboratory had used math to design airplanes. Now it would need math to create spaceships as well. The government decided to change the agency's name from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy told Congress, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. A man on the moon? But the first step to getting the man on the moon was to send an astronaut around the Earth. NASA was going to need to hire more space experts and more people who were good at math. Really good. The people at the laboratory had to work together from morning to night to figure out how to send astronaut John Glenn into space and bring him back home safely. Catherine knew she could use math to help. Tell me where you want his spaceship to land, and I'll tell you where to launch it, Catherine told her boss. Catherine helped calculate the trajectories, or the pathways that rockets travel through space. She had to plan John's exact route from takeoff in Florida to splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. There was no room for error. No one was better than Catherine at solving these tricky math problems. Days before his mission, John Glenn wanted Catherine to double check the machine's computer trajectory calculations to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. When Catherine said the numbers were correct, Glenn was ready to go. On February 20th, 1962, Glenn blasted off into space, circled the Earth, and made his way home safely. Meanwhile, laws began to change so that black and white students could go to school together. Blacks fought for the right to sit beside whites on buses and to drink from the same water fountains. The laboratory, black and white computers, started working together in the same offices, eating at the same lunch tables, and using the same bathrooms. Black and white moviegoers could sit next to each other in the same theater. Across the country, people started to think about ways to bring equality to all Americans. Christine Darden was good at math, and she loved electronic computers. She started working at Langley in 1967. Christine wanted to become an engineer, and thanks to Dorothy, Mary, and Catherine, she knew it was possible. Eventually, she became an engineer for supersonic airplanes, planes flying faster than the speed of sound. But her first job was to help with NASA and in their mission to the moon. The people at the laboratory prepared for years to send astronauts to the moon about 238,900 miles away from the Earth. Finally, on July 20th, 1969, the world watches three men arrive at the moon in their Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, said Neil Armstrong when he stepped onto the dusty surface. But it was also a giant leap for Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, Christine, and all of the other computers and engineers who had worked at the laboratory for over the years. The moon landing was a success from takeoff to splashdown, but there was no time to rest. 
Once NASA landed astronauts on the moon, the people at the laboratory began dreaming of sending humans to other planets such as Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. They started to imagine hyperfast space planes that could travel around the Earth at seven times the speed of sound. The next adventure wouldn't be easy and will require lots of tests and a lot more numbers. But Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine knew one thing. With hard work and perseverance and a love of math, anything was possible. That ends the book, Hidden Figures. And on a personal note, I just wanted to say, I think anything that you put your mind to, you can accomplish. I love that story so, so very much. I am incredibly inspired to take on the world. And of course, for one final thing, Roger Montero gave us a lunch video. So, as we take a look at an awesome lunch happening at Kennedy Space Center, I'd like to say thank you to Roger, industrial electrician at Kennedy Space Center, friend and lovely reader. I hope you have a great one. Thank you for coming to our story time, and I cannot wait till we can all be together again at Miami Children's Museum. For now, this is Crystal signing off. I hope you have a great one. Make sure to like, to share, and to subscribe. Bye, friends.